Oh hi, I didn't see you there. My name is Bliss Foster. Welcome back to the fourth installment of my ongoing series exploring the work of Martin Margiela one runway show at a time. Today we have a bulldozer on our hands. We're exploring fall winter 1990. The show took place on March 15th, 1990 at a post office in the 18th arrondissement, which continues Martin's ongoing theme of hosting these shows in public places. You'll remember that so far we've seen shows done at a cafe slash theater type space, we've seen one done at a nightclub, and we've seen one done at a neighborhood playground public park. Now we find ourselves at a large, busy post office that is very far away from where the rest of Paris Fashion Week is happening at the center of Paris. As is often the case, I'm just going to read to you the first paragraph that comes in the Women's Collection book. This is one of the most valuable resources that I have for creating this series. It just has a ton of information, and they always open in ways that I feel are a little bit better than I could do myself. Guests were invited to the Cernam Warehouses, a transportation, luggage, and parcel service located in the 18th arrondissement. The invitation was an empty envelope. A label on the back indicated the date and location of the event and the word invitation was stamped diagonally across the envelope in large red letters. People were jam packed on wood chairs while photographers were perched on scaffolding and sitting on the floor. A bouquet of wilted flowers was placed under a plaque commemorating the SNCF, the French National Railway Company, agents that were killed between 1939 and 1945. The runway, a simple strip of carpeting, was covered with a large plastic tarp that was removed by employees in white coats to signal the beginning of the show. Now I think it's important that I'm honest with you guys up front. For the first two runway shows, we had a surprising amount of footage. Whoever was in charge of the camera looked like he had done some meth or something beforehand because it got a little crazy sometimes, but for the most part, we had really clear shots of a lot of these looks of which no photography exists. You guys might remember that for the last episode of this series where we covered spring summer 1990, there was a rather disappointing lack of videography. Here we do have a lot of videography, but it's not very clear videography. So I'm going to show you what we have. We still have a ton of information about this show. We still have a lot of interesting stuff that we need to cover, but just be aware that there just isn't a whole lot of video of this that's publicly available right now. Okay, so let's start the way that they start, which is footage of backstage. In the past, we've only gotten runway footage and maybe a quick clip or two behind the scenes. Here, they literally bring you backstage. Remember that in the past, they've hinted at backstage, but we haven't physically gone there yet with the camera. It's pretty typical stuff if you've seen a lot of backstage at runway footage. There's not a lot of surprises here. But what I think is so crazy here is that they're continuing this awesome idea that they've started since the very beginning of bringing the audience into the process of the art. Fashion is notorious back then and now especially for having a massive black curtain that says keep out of anything that has to do with their processes or how things get made or just anything that doesn't have to do with the final product. Because fashion is an industry that focuses on outward beauty, it's understandable why they would take this stance, but that makes it all the more revolutionary that Martin has continued this theme. You remember that in the first show, when the audience was filing into the auditorium to watch the show, there were microphones hung from backstage that projected out all of the noises and the scuffling and all of the hurried last minute things that were happening backstage. They couldn't see it, but they could hear everything that was going on. And then of course, in just the three runway shows that they've put on so far, there have been countless examples in the clothes themselves where the process has been brought out in the final product. For Margiela, it's pretty safe to say that in many ways, the process is the art. I'm actually not sure why they had this emphasis on the railway workers that passed away during this time frame. That is the time frame that was largely Nazi occupation of France, and so that might have something to do with it. The camera then takes us out into the crowd that is waiting for the runway show to start. They spend multiple minutes here just looking at people in the crowd, maybe giving us a little bit of a sense of who the people were that were coming to the shows now. It's probably a pretty different scene of people than when they first started out. During the first show, many people were in attendance because the legendary Jean-Paul Gaudier had told everyone, this was my best assistant, I don't think he needed my training, but man, he is gonna make some incredible stuff. Go see his work. So many people were there at that first show and that second show, but 
I think it was less buyers and less press and maybe a little bit more students and just artsy people from around Paris or maybe other people who were peripherally related to the fashion scene. And the runway show before this one wasn't necessarily a hit in the press. Many people didn't like it, but it certainly got covered by a lot of magazines. So we see people selling the issue of Details magazine that Margiela made the cover of. We see this very 80s Chanel lady. We see people drawing and we see people reading and we see this guy with this jacket that says destroy on it. All in all, we're getting a very street style-esque of who's showing up to small, cool runway shows during Paris Fashion Week in 1990. As they already mentioned in the book, this runway has been laid out before them. It's a very simple runway, white runway, just a piece of carpeting textile. And it's been covered with plastic that employees then remove when the show actually gets started. We saw something kind of similar to this in the very first show where it was just a plain piece of white cotton. But we remember that that then got reused for the second show and got torn up. The runway itself literally got torn up into pattern pieces to make their first artisanal pieces. Sitting across from all of the guests are street performers playing maracas and tom-toms. It's interesting here that they didn't put them in white coats. You remember that for the second show it was mostly performed by a live band. They put that band in the white coats. I wonder if maybe the difference here is that that was an established band that was kind of part of the art scene, whereas here they were trying to do more of a slice of life situation and it would seem kind of strange to take actual street performers, which we might presume these guys are, and then tell them what to wear. It seems like the things that they're wearing when they're doing their street performances, that that's kind of part of what makes the art what it is. But either way, this is a situation where a group of people are part of the artwork that is a Margiela runway show, but they are not given the white coats. And with that, the staff steps forward and removes the plastic covering from the white carpeted runway. The street performers start blaring out music. It's incredibly loud in this building now. And the first model emerges. Much to the surprise of me, the first time I saw this show, and I'm sure to the people who were sitting there trying to take notes on what they were actually going to buy for their stores, the models come flooding out. This looks like what is literally the final flood of the end of a runway show, where all the models come out like quickly one after another. That's typically done so that you can get some kind of summary of what you've just seen, but here it's just happening right from the very start. We get these clumps of models that are all emerging out kind of so quickly that you can't see what's going on. <laughs> at one point the camera looks over at the photographers and they're clearly a little bit panicked because no one can get a clear look at what's actually happening. <laughs> this mixed with the live music being so loud must have created a very chaotic, overwhelming environment. But what's really interesting is that all of the models are smiling. They all seem kind of like they're in this sort of playful moment together. This surely was very unlike anything that a lot of these people had seen before in a runway show. And I think there's a bit of a sales strategy at work here as well. We're moving incredibly fast, even for a runway show. Usually, even if models are walking quickly, they're spaced out in some capacity so that you can sort of see every look as its own thing. The music is incredibly loud. Everyone is packed in really tightly. I think that this is serving two purposes. Firstly, I think this makes the show memorable. A lot of these people are seeing a ton of shows over the course of 10 days. This makes it where they'll at least remember that fucking crazy blitz at the post office way out in the 18th arrondissement. Secondly, and I think more importantly, this might have been something that made it where buyers needed to come to the showroom in order to get a closer look at everything. So if each look and every model is very clearly visible and well lit, then maybe some buyers, some more closed-minded buyers might think, eh, that's not what I need in my store this season. However, if it is high impact but hard to see, it provokes extra interest and might get them another dozen appointments that they might not have had otherwise. We also notice at a few points that there is confetti in the model's hair. This confetti was actually reused at this show from the last show, which is so cool because the history of confetti itself was born out of a mentality of reuse. 
which is pretty easy to envision. Confetti is pretty literally just brightly colored, lightweight pieces of trash. At one point, one of the model's boyfriends walks down the runway with her. It's really hard to tell if this was pre-planned or if this was something that is spontaneous. I've watched this clip a whole lot and I really can't put my finger on whether this was pre-planned or if this is just something where he was just sort of drunk and jumped up last minute. But either way, that adds a ton to this jubilant, joyous kind of feel to this runway show. Being that they are in a post office, some of the models had actual postage stamp markings applied on their faces. That blue ink gave it a very distinctive look. At one point in the video, we actually see someone walking out, really demonstrating their principles by showing them that they do not approve. This might as well become a trademark of the house at this point because someone has walked out of every show they've put on. I wonder what that guy thinks about that now. Just walking out in protest of one of the most legendary maisons of the 20th century. As if the show itself wasn't enough of a flood, there was in fact a final flood just like every other show where we see the employees emerging with the models where everyone is dressed in the same white coats that have come to represent anonymity in the house. You'll remember from previous episodes where these coats almost seem to be saying this isn't about the individual people who are in this show or making this show happen. The show is itself a single artwork and that art can speak for itself. It doesn't need personalities, it doesn't need celebrities, it can speak for itself. We'll also remember from before that these coats are a very common item at ateliers for fit models. We do see something a little bit different this season. At least one model we can see here has her test shot pinned to her coat. It's another demonstration of Margiela welcoming the viewer into the process behind the art, but also possibly it could hint that maybe these coats were not just one size fits all as they would be at a normal atelier. Perhaps here they're meant to find the one with their photo on it because they've been tailor made for each model. That would be an extremely personable, luxurious detail on what is typically just an afterthought item of clothing. This is also another runway show where Martin comes out at the end. This photograph is one of the most widely distributed of our boy. And this legendary t-shirt is one that actually will appear in the show itself. We'll look at that here in a bit. The t-shirt features Iggy Pop, whose music was used in the first runway show that Margiela ever put on. During the time when he spoke to the press, Margiela told a journalist from Mary Claire, there are two principles to which I adhere, hide nothing, and don't act rich. Those are ideas that are pretty in line with our mentality here in 2019. They were uh, not in alignment with the world of 1990 in Paris. <laughs> All right, well, in the spirit of hide nothing, I'm gonna tell you that it is getting too dark outside and your boy uses windows for his lighting and we've had to flip the house lights on. The beautiful yellow house lights. Also, this LaCroix is just for show. You're learning all the secrets. Okay, so now that we've looked at a lot of footage of the runway show itself and we've kind of talked about the art piece as a whole, let's zoom in as much as we can and talk about those individual pieces where those sweet, sweet details lie. First of all, the tags that are being applied to these clothes are still in their early stages. They're still very much treating the design of these tags as if it's something that people will just cut off as soon as they buy the thing. Thankfully, everyone didn't do that, so we still have some documentation of it. Many of the models wore these massive thigh-high boots that accentuated the way that they were walking down the runway. All of the boots were khaki rubber wading boots that were made by a brand called Agle. A-I-G-L-E. You tell me if I pronounced it right. But what they did is they painted those boots black, brown, and white the night before. But as anyone who has tried to paint on clothes or boots before has seen, if you don't use the right kind of paint, it's going to slough off. And slough off it did. We had some very beautiful looking distressing going on with some of these boots. There's just multiple examples where we get to see this glorification of modified workwear that we've seen in the past with Margiela and this painting over detail that we've seen before and that we'll see for the rest of Martin's career. But we can see this idea early enough that we can see it not being executed perfectly. It's beautiful for what it is, but it's not very sellable like that. We see a new detail being introduced in this season and that is permanent fold marks. 
It's not really possible to see this detail in the video itself. Also, interesting fact that we know because of the notes about this show, the garment that had the permanent crease marks was worn over turtlenecks that were bought at a discount department store called Tati. That was a place that everybody in Paris would have known about. It's a very cheap place for people to go get clothes. Those turtlenecks were modified, they were slashed up and reconfigured in a certain way. But the point is that up until now, we've mostly been using vintage clothing that's been modified. Here, they're showing and glorifying stuff that is just cheap clothing. It's brand new clothing, but it's very, very discounted. It's the kind of clothing that the working class would buy. So they've made this point before of glorifying used and cheap clothing, but here they're doing a slightly different take on that idea by getting stuff from a discount department store. This show introduces another huge theme going forward for Margiela, and that is dresses made out of lining material for dresses. So if you've never had the pleasure of wearing a dress before, typically there is a lining material that's usually made of something like viscose that is put between your skin and the actual material that's on the outside of the dress. This is done for a number of different reasons. But typically lining material is very cheap, very basic, and just is totally focused on comfort. The idea of ripping out the inside of a dress and just wearing the lining is something that I'm guessing nobody was doing. It's like a vision of poverty that's sort of so extreme that I don't think it was happening with anybody except like crazy people. We also see Margiela trying out this kind of punk grunge mohair sweater that's been pulled apart in a number of different places and has a really exaggerated neck. They didn't have a relationship with a sweater manufacturer, and so Margiela's mother actually made all of those sweaters. We also see a little detail from the first season because the actual sleeves that were used in the first season, the removable men's dress shirt sleeves, can be seen underneath this specific look. Just another example of them taking pieces and the building blocks from their own shows to kind of create this whole universe around the way that they do clothes. There's also this incredible piece. This has got to be my favorite piece of clothing that they've made so far. It's these skirts that were done in a couple of different colors that have these rings with metal clips like the kind that you would have in a fitting room curtain to hold it up. Those are strung across a cotton ribbon and it looks perfect. Like this is the most beautiful item. It's, I mean, it's based off of a fitting room. This is another thing where it's a very provocative concept, one that on paper would look like kind of something that is impossible to do in a way that wouldn't seem kitschy, but then when they actually execute the thing and it's designed really well, you look at it and you say, wow, I, I want that. And let me tell you, I do want that. There's another few looks where tights have the feet cut off of them and then get stretched over boots or stretched over pants or shorts. And the result is that they are clinging all of those things very, very closely. It just creates a lot of visual interest. It makes the viewer ask, what's, what's happening here? The boas that are seen in the show use feathers from the marabou stork. And that is a bald bird that looks like it is from the movie The Dark Crystal. Anyway, these specific birds, I think, were a very purposeful choice because they have built-in pockets for their mouths. Kind of a pants pocket idea as seen through the eyes of nature kind of deal. The boas themselves are very luxurious looking, but as always, it's this kind of drab take on luxury that the house is becoming known for. One of the big ticket items from this show were these long felt dresses that were covered in these small vertical slits. Because it's felt, it hugged over curves really effectively, but the slits made it where it sort of emphasized all of the parts of you that did curve. It was a dress that sort of, in its construction, amplified the shape of your body. At one point, we see what appears to be the general idea of a cage crinoline under a skirt. This seems to be an attempt to modernize a very historic piece of body scaffolding. I mean, if you look at something like this, it doesn't really strike you as something that has a lot of relevance in contemporary fashion, and definitely not with a brand that has such a fixation on real people. But this kind of juxtaposition is something that Margiela does extremely well. Hey everybody, last minute edition here. I noticed this while editing at one o'clock in the morning. I think that effect is being brought about by the boots underneath the skirt. I still think that the intention is that it's supposed to look like a cage crinoline, but the effect is being given by the size of those massive ass boots. 
In addition to those gorgeous boots, we also see an extension of the oversized idea here. This appears to be a normal fitting tank top for the top, but the bottom back has been substantially stretched out. Here in an editorial shot that was of course photographed later, we see the model wearing an outfit that brings out the Margiela shoulder through layering this suede vest on top of this sheer black blouse. The black blouse is the one with the Margiela shoulder, but it's probably too light of a material to really let that shoulder flourish fully if it was just being worn alone. But because of the weight of the vest on top of it, it really allows that shoulder to pop. We've obviously seen many takes on the Margiela shoulder. We haven't seen one that produces that shape as a result of layering yet. That's a really interesting detail here. This seems to be a modified motorcycle style jacket that's been turned into a vest. The high collar with the slope down shoulder is a really different silhouette than anything we've seen from Martin yet. We can also see that the cork necklaces have been brought back. It was something that was used in the second runway presentation along with those skirt pantsuits. Beautiful transformation on this knitwear. It looks like she wore a regular sweater and then took an identical sweater and tucked it over her head. Wow, it has gotten dark in here. So that's kind of like if you took a t-shirt and did this with it. As is always the case, the item has been tailored to death to ensure that the look is very convincing, but that the fit is still very comfortable. Also, we see the Margiela shoulder executed as if it's just scrunched up knitwear, although it is clearly due to purposeful pattern cutting. Also, I think this one here is a result of what the notes refer to as flat sweaters. So these wide ribbed wool tubes had zippers down the front and the uh, sleeves are separate but have been sewn on so they are clearly detached. And okay, I, I've just gotta say, the artisanal knitwear designer, the, the guy at the time was Lutz Huhl, he is fucking crushing it in this show. These are incredible sweaters. We have another detached sleeve, some structure built into that shoulder, and a lot of grunge detailing that features silver lurex thread, which is just a brand name for a type of thread with a metallic appearance. Here we see another application of the purposeful oversizing. This very slimly cut zip up dress is reversed, something that we've seen done to skirts and to shirts in previous shows, and it fits tightly over a t-shirt that's drastically too big. We see the bunching up at the collar there, and that kind of imitates those little details of a typical couture gown. But as it was done with the Spring Summer 1990 show, this putting a tight garment over a drastically oversized garment creates all of these little details and allows them to emerge in a way that's much more organic. Here we can see that the model is wearing that same t-shirt that we'll later see Martin in, but she's also wearing a really fascinating coat. We can see that the cuffs on those sleeves are way, way, way too long. So long in fact that they've actually had to be rolled up. Same kind of situation with the collar where it's been modified and extended a good bit. This creates a really beautiful silhouette on a jacket that's typically meant to just be completely utilitarian. And later on in this picture, we can actually see that those sleeves are separate. Yet another example of removable sleeves that we've seen done since the very first runway show. And just to bring it back to this look one more time, look at that shoulder. This might be the most extreme version of the Margiela shoulder that we've seen so far. We're almost getting into Tim Burton or Rick Owens territory here. Them's are some wicked witch of the woods kind of shoulders. Thank you so much for joining me. I think there's been a little bit of confusion about this series. We are going to be covering every Martin Margiela runway show at Mason Martin Margiela. That's gonna be 40 something episodes. A lot of people thought that the series was somehow ending after this one. It's not. We're doing 40 something episodes. Please tell a friend about this series. Please tell your fashion professor about this series. Even though it gets so dark at the end of some episodes, please share these episodes with Friends, we really need to spread the word on this channel. Please go follow me on Instagram. Go follow me on Twitter. I will see you all later. I love you so much.